Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I hope that you are all well and healthy. Um, I'm delighted to say that we are back in business, or at least we are trying to uh, be back uh, in business. Um, uh, let me thank you, uh, our IT team, Peter and Michael, for uh, working very hard to make uh, uh, this uh, move of the center to the virtual space. And um, uh, many thanks to Elaine and all the staff uh, at the CES for working so hard over the last couple of weeks uh, to keep all the balls in the air and, uh, and attending to all the needs uh, we, we have uh, and our students have and so on. So that's uh, uh, many thanks to all of you. Uh, now, this is an experiment. Um, this is our first uh, webinar. Uh, things may go wrong. Um, um, uh, if they do, don't be surprised. Um, uh, if they uh, don't go wrong, uh, we will have a few more in to the end of the semester. Uh, and I hope that uh, uh, we will be back in person at uh, some time uh, soon. Now, I'm grateful to uh, Yasha Monk for agreeing to join us uh, uh, to assess the present situation and challenges the situation poses to democracy. Um, Yasha doesn't need too much introduction in uh, our company, but let me say that uh, uh, Yasha is the writer, academic, and uh, public intellectual known for his work on rise of populism and the crisis of liberal democracy. Uh, he is uh, currently the associate professor uh, of the practice of international affairs at John Hopkins University uh, and holds appointments both in SAIS and Agora Institute. He's a senior fellow in a number of uh, think tanks, including uh, German Marshall Fund, uh, and he's a member of uh, Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, his latest book, um, The People Versus Democracy, Why Our Freedom is in Danger and How to Save It, uh, was translated into 11 uh, languages um, and um, uh, received um, lots of accolades, uh, including the best book of the year um, by Financial Times in 2018. Uh, Yasha is also a prolific uh, writer and regular contributor to a number of American and European newspapers and magazines, uh, including New York Times, New Yorker, The Atlantic, uh, Die Zeit, La Repubblica, L'Express. Uh, so I'm you know, very proud that he was part of our community for so many years, uh, uh, first as a graduate student uh, and then as a lecturer. Uh, so Yasha, uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to have you back uh, um, to the center affairs and uh, uh, the floor is yours. Well, first of all, Xavier, thank you for the honor of uh, being your first guinea pig uh, in this format. Um, uh, I hope things will go terribly wrong, um, you know, and we'll get some entertainment out of it. Um, uh, the other thing that I just want to say uh, by way of introduction is that, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know that I would have made it through to have a PhD and to have a position I don't have and so on if uh, you hadn't been one of my uh, teachers and mentors from the very beginning um, and taking, you know, many hours just chatting with me uh, uh, in the CS uh, throughout my time in graduate school. So it's, it's particularly nice to have this conversation together. Um, and it's nice to remember times which weren't quite as odd and scary as the one we're, we're, we're living through right now. Um, so look, um, I, I think all we can do is speculate. And obviously a lot of my remarks are gonna be speculative. Um, I wanna say first of all, something about the situation we find ourselves in and then about uh, some of the different ways that might impact uh, populism and democracy particularly. Uh, so uh, we can then, you know, range more widely in, in your questions and, and, and those of everybody else. Um, look, so the first uh, point to make is that this is the most extraordinary crisis that I have lived through in my adult life, and I think most people on this call will have lived through in our adult lives. Um, it's extraordinary uh, because it is so global, and it's extraordinary because it has radically transformed the lives of over half of humanity. Uh, in the course of a month, uh, in a way that uh, even some of the most horrific wars uh, arguably uh, did not do. Um, now, one of the dangers is that we don't update our political thinking, um, uh, you know, sticking with the pitched ideological battles, which, which are important, remain important, were important, uh, but just thinking about this situation as a matter of how will it impact the fights that we are invested in so deeply a month ago or a year ago? 
But that's not the most important question facing us right now. The most important question is, will we succeed collectively in our country and in the world to uh, reduce the death toll, which might be in the, in the tens of millions, uh, to much, much lower levels? Um, and that should be the first thing uh, that's on our mind. Um, and it particularly disqualifies attempts uh, by people who might be tempted to that. I'm tempted to think about, you know, what does that mean for populism? Because that's what I've been working on. That's what I think is very important. Um, but the stakes of whether the United States has the right reaction or the wrong reaction is, is, is millions of our fellow citizens living or dying. And that's more important than how it will affect the, the, the elections in November and so on. So that's just something that I sort of, I've, I've been seeing the last weeks, people jumping back into this. What does this mean for all the stuff we've always cared about? Well, the first question is what is actually going on and can we beat this? And, and I think that's a generally open question. I'm trying to think through this right now. Uh, there are many, many signs of deep failure, um, uh, you know, from uh, the horrifically lacking leadership of Donald Trump, from his complete inconsistency uh, week to week and day to day and hour to hour, uh, to other uh, politicians, many of them populists around the world, who are uh, denying uh, the threat of the virus, uh, people from AMLO in Mexico to Jair Bolsonaro uh, in Brazil. Um, and at the individual level, it's easy to, to, to point fingers at the people who are still out uh, enjoying the beaches in Florida over spring break uh, a few weeks ago, um, at the mayor of New York City who's still being chauffeured to take walks in, uh, in Prospect Park every day, um, to the profiteers who are trying to make money off of this crisis, um, even at the cost of uh, warehousing uh, urgently needed medical supplies. Um, and it may be that that's the story that we're going to be telling about this 10 or 20 years ago, a story of failure of uh, some of these extreme figures, but also a failure of some of the basic democratic institutions, because the CDC hasn't exactly uh, acted particularly well either. Even though it's now doing much better, uh, the German government didn't exactly act very well in the beginning phases either. So perhaps we'll remember a story of blundering and of crisis, uh, and that's quite possible. Um, I also think, though, it's possible uh, that in this fog of pandemic, uh, we are underestimating the extent to which we are meeting uh, this collective challenge. Uh, the cases, the number of cases are starting to go down. Uh, it is remarkable that we have decided to shut down life in order to avoid the deaths of millions of our compatriots. And if we somehow pull this off, if we do manage to contain how many cases we have and put in place uh, through all this chaos an effective regime of test and treat and quarantine that uh, allows us to eventually go back to work uh, without mass casualties, that would be one of the great achievements in the history of humanity. Um, I'm not saying that that'll be the outcome, but it could be the outcome. And that would actually be very inspiring. I think it's worth keeping that in mind. All right, so with that important proviso, let me say a few words about uh, what all of this means for, for democracy and populism. Uh, and it's very early days, uh, but I think there's sort of three stories that we might experience coming out of this. The first is that this systematically confirms uh, the narrative of the populists. If you'd asked me three months ago to come up with a set of global events that better seem to uh, uh, demonstrate that Trump's uh, narrative about the world actually has some truth to it than the current pandemic, I would have struggled to do better. Um, you could see how it would confirm the idea that the world is very dangerous, that globalization and the international movement of people is an existential threat to us, that one of the good solutions is to close down borders, um, that we should really worry about China. I'm not saying that it's in fact true that the pandemic proves all those things, but it is easily exploited in those ways to, to, uh, to, to underscore that narrative. Um, and so uh, it may be that populists are able to use this in order to scare people, in order to make them believe in uh, the dangers um, and in order to motivate uh, uh, more policies and more politicians along their lines. Now, the second possibility goes exactly in the opposite direction. It's that the basic narrative of the anti-populists is finally confirmed. Uh, people who are critics of populism, like me, uh, have said for a long time that populists are extremely dangerous because they don't trust experts, experts, they don't trust independent institutions, they don't trust the rule of law. 
uh, and all of that leads to corruption and cronyism and incompetence and chaos, and that'll have really bad impacts on the lives of ordinary citizens. Now, as long as there were no deep, deep crisis, as long as somebody like Donald Trump had the huge good luck for him and for all of us, it turns out, uh, that there was no externally produced crisis of a major uh, dimension that he had to deal with in the last years, um, all of those warnings ran a little bit hollow because people said, you know what, you said that Trump would be a disaster, but the economy is going fine, my life hasn't changed, you know, were you really right about those warnings? Was that not a little bit exaggerated? Uh, well, it could be that coming out of this moment, uh, that changes. But we see a systematic difference in how Germany or Poland deal with this, uh, uh, sorry, how Germany or France deal with this uh, moment compared to how the United States or Brazil deal with this moment. That people in America sadly come to recognize just how high a price they're going to pay uh, for the distrust of experts, for the undermining of independent institutions, for the partisan rancor and the chaos in uh, the current White House uh, administration. Now, I think there's a third possibility, and it's probably the one uh, that I'm most tempted by. Um, and that is uh, rather less uh, systemic. It is simply to say that governments are going to suffer and the opposition is going to benefit. That's not what we've seen so far. So far, we've seen a rally around the flag effect. Uh, but I don't think that's going to last very long. Uh, I don't think rally around the flag effects tend to last that long. And they particularly don't tend to last that long when you don't have a human enemy. It's easier to rally around uh, the flag if uh, you know, you're fighting a foreign power or if you're afraid of terrorism and you can put faces up on uh, television, even though we have some uh, nice renderings of a virus, I don't think that you can incite the same collective solidarity and defense against an abstract entity like a virus uh, as you could if this was terrorism or this was, uh, you know, a national security threat from another nation uh, or something like that. Uh, and eventually, as we know from famous things like uh, the work on the sharks in the New Jersey towns in 1918 and people not re-electing Woodrow Wilson because they blame him for shark attacks in the local towns, um, I think you will see anger at the suffering that people are feeling uh, take over. Uh, that anger will be perhaps particularly deep in countries where the governments are clearly failing, where we have lots of excess deaths, which is to say lots of deaths uh, which uh, perhaps were necessary, which did not happen in countries that had better responses. Um, uh, but I think we'll see it everywhere, because everywhere we'll see a lot of people die, even in the best case scenario, and everywhere uh, we will see uh, the economy take a very deep uh, hit. So just very briefly at the end, um, I'm going to look forward to a, to a conversation. Uh, what should defenders of democracy do right now? Uh, how can we actually uh, assure that we maximize the chances of uh, preserving democracies in this moment? Um, I think that falls into two categories. It falls into the category of what we shouldn't do, and then it falls into the category of what we affirm that we should do. Uh, what we shouldn't do is to uh, let people like Viktor Orban uh, con us into giving up our liberties. Uh, we should hold every uh, new power that the government takes uh, to three basic conditions. They are that uh, any emergency measure has to be under democratic and where appropriate uh, judicial control. They are that they need to be temporary and not just rhetorically temporary, but temporary in such a way that they are in place for a specific period of time and they need to be re-upped affirmatively at the end of that period uh, if a necessity is still there. Uh, and thirdly, that they are narrowly tailored uh, to actually fighting the virus and saving lives. Uh, the actions that Viktor Orban has taken in Hungary, turning his country into uh, an outright dictatorship, fail all three of those uh, tests. Um, he has taken the power to uh, abolish parliament and rule by decree indefinitely. Uh, there's no democratic control over his actions. Um, and he can do things like jail people for spreading uh, false rumors on uh, Twitter or Facebook, uh, which is not uh, strictly necessary in order to save lives. Uh, so we should resist those kinds of retirement lives. At the same time, we should also recognize that this is a truly extraordinary situation, that we owe it to our fellow citizens to do what we can to avoid the millions of deaths that might result 
from inaction, from an inability to rethink the situation, from an unwillingness to take some rather extreme measures on social distancing, on quarantining sick people and so on. And in the end, that is the biggest danger to democracy. Because if a narrative that comes out of this, wrongly and especially rightly, should turn out to be that democracies were not able to protect the citizens in a moment of supreme danger, uh, that is going to uh, do permanent damage to the reputation, to the reality of democracies around the world. Okay, uh, great. Uh, thank you so much, Yasha. Um, I think you raised a lot of uh, 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 different points in this uh, very short presentation, and I think um, uh, some of, uh, uh, of which I sense uh, 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 slightly contradict uh, uh, one another. Um, let me um, um, ask you first um, um, about the issue of uh, trade-offs. Um, I think that um, the present situation for the first time made just completely clear and obvious uh, uh, the, the terrible nature of choices uh, societies have to make uh, in a situation like, uh, like this one. Um, and uh, I would like to point to two of those trade-offs. Uh, so, you know, the first one is uh, uh, between protecting people and, uh, and saving economy. Uh, or between sort of you know short term measures and and long term uh, outcomes um, and we have had the discussion about this um, for already for for some time and 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 there are very clear positions on this uh, on this uh, trade off uh, uh, but the second one is uh, is equally important and um, and um, that trade off is between authoritarian strategies um, of fighting the uh, virus and preserving uh, some basic liberties um, and freedoms. Um, now, um, um, we had two questions uh, from, from our participants in the webinar, from Radek Sikorski and from Jonathan Bolton, uh, really emphasizing uh, this dilemma. Uh, does it mean that if you oppose authoritarian uh, strategies, that means that you are not uh, caring enough uh, for the people uh, who potentially can uh, get sick and die, um, or does it mean that that uh, you know you are in this completely pragmatic uh, mood that uh, regardless of suffering um, uh, things should be uh, should be protected? Um, now, the Jonathan's question goes in, into the direction of how long those um, authoritarian strategies are going to last. Um, if we introduce, you know, all those measures China has introduced, uh, not only fighting the virus, but also in Xinjiang and, and in other places, are we stuck with, uh, with this authoritarian intrusion for many years to come? And uh, what does it mean uh, in the long run for, uh, for democracy? Uh, so let me, let me just pose this uh, to you about this kind of two types of trade-offs and, and see what you, uh, what you think of. About. Yeah. I mean, look, I think uh, we are still at the moment in which the trade-off between the economy and fighting this virus is largely imagined. Um, because right now, uh, as we're seeing in New York City, we are so close to our public health system completely breaking down, to people being unable to be treated if they get seriously sick from corona, or for that matter, if they get sick from something else. Um, uh, that you cannot have a functional economy uh, under those circumstances. So if we, uh, three or four weeks ago, had not, uh, uh, here's what many people gave, but that I gave in this article, cancel everything, um, and, uh, uh, and send students home, um, and made all these tough decisions, uh, the economy would not be any, any better right now. Um, and you're seeing in the last days, I'm a little nervous about this, but you're seeing in the last days, the stock market going up, because these extreme measures of social distancing have in fact started to reduce the cases. Um, and I think, uh, though that's a little over optimistic, um, investors are onto something. But in the end, the best thing for the economy is to make sure that there's as few cases of this as possible. Um, now, I think that's temporary, which is to say that we need to be using this period in order to put in place the measures that will allow us to reopen our economy and to reopen our lives to the extent possible while we await the arrival of a vaccine. 
And in order to do that, we need a system of uh, test, treat, and quarantine. So we need to radically improve our ability to test people week after week if necessary to make sure they aren't asymptomatic carriers of this disease to get uh, under one or as close to one as possible. We need to design systems that can actually effectively quarantine people in the home so that there aren't a minority of sick people who keep going about their lives in a way that, that endangers us all and then collectively forces us to have these extreme measures at social distancing and so on. And we need to uh, push out the capacity of our healthcare system to deal with corona and to implement quickly and unbureaucratically um, some of the promising uh, treatments uh, that might make a difference. Now, you know, um, uh, the, the positive thing about these different effects is that they are multiplicative. So if we managed to decrease the number of people who get corona uh, by two thirds, if we get it to one third of what it would be, if we make sure that the number of corona patients we can treat is three times higher than it would otherwise be, and if we manage to, serve, to save two thirds of the patients that might otherwise die, uh, the difference is not one ninth plus one ninth plus one ninth, which is to say one third. It is one nine, one third times, sorry, not one, yeah, it is one third times one third times one third, which is to say uh, that actually only one out of the 27 people who would otherwise die will pass away. So that's what we should be using the time uh, of social distancing to put in place. And if we manage to put that in place, then we might be able to um, open our economy and then we might get into an area where there is some trade-off between a few more people dying because we're going back to our lives, um, but uh, a lot of people being saved and our healthcare system continuing to function, then we can talk about that trade-off. That moment might arrive. Right now is the time to put in place the things that we need to minimize the trade-off. And my biggest worry at the moment is that governments everywhere aren't effectively doing that. Um, now on the... Let me, let me just uh, uh, say one more thing about this, right? So, you know, this seems like a solution for the West uh, that, you know, we can afford um, to have the economy shut down for another few months and uh, we have pretty good uh, health system and, uh, and the vaccines and other things will be coming. Um, what about the other parts of the world? I, I think that's, um, that's really is, um, um, you know, the, 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 the laborers in India, uh, just can't, you know, postpone uh, working because they die of hunger, not of uh, coronavirus, right? So is that different set of dilemmas for uh, for other parts of the world? Yeah, I, I was speaking yesterday for my podcast um, to to David Miliband, who you know heads the International Rescue Committee, and they're just about to publish a study uh, uh, that shows you know the number of ventilators in. I'm I'm I'm, I'm hoping I'm getting this wrong. I believe it's the number of ventilators in South Sudan is four. The numbers of uh, ventilators in Liberia is one. Um, and in many uh, uh, neighborhoods, and particularly in many refugee camps, you don't have basic running water, so you don't have basic provisions for people to be able to wash their hands. Um, so this will hit those countries in an extreme way. Um, and, and, and it's very difficult to know uh, what we can do to help uh, at this point. Um, there are some great programs, the IRC and other people are running to try and get those basic uh, healthcare provisions to those places as quickly as possible right now. Uh, but obviously, uh, you cannot build a functioning public health infrastructure in a matter of months or years. This is a result, a tragic result of, of years and decades of underinvestment. So, um, so I, 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 I don't know that there is a solution. I don't know that I have a solution. Um, but we, we definitely all need to pay a lot more attention to that question. Um, just very briefly on the second question you'd asked about on the trade-off of civil liberties. Uh, look, that's a tough trade-off, right? And, and as I was saying, the minimum condition has to be democratic, temporary, strictly necessary. But then there's still gonna be questions of, you know, you can have a surveillance program for people who are suspected of being sick with corona, where, you know, if their cell phone uh, leaves their apartment, uh, they get a fine. Um, uh, and that's a way of uh, essentially you know, locking people up indoors temporarily to make sure they don't spread the disease. Um, you know, you can do that in a way where you can have judicial appeal against the fine, where that's a temporary measure and it's clearly helping to save lives. You might still say you're not going to do it because the trade-off with freedom of movement and civil liberties is too big. That's a really tough call. And you have to see country by country 
how desperate the situation is, how much you can trust the government, um, and how willing people are to make that trade-off. All I will say is that defenders of democracy right now have to get the balance right between opposing authoritarian power grabs or sacrifices to our civil, li civil liberties that are not proportionate and, 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 and not normally justifiable on the one side, and just crying wolf and opposing everything on the other side. Because if the impression that people get out of this is that democracy means that every now and again, a huge percentage of the population just has to die, that will not help us defend democracy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, our uh, friends, uh, Steve Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt published this uh, essay uh, in New York Times several months ago, which is quite prophetic, uh, uh, in which they argue that uh, autocrats love emergencies. Uh, that, um, um, you know, and of course we already see the number of cases uh, uh, which we illustrate that, uh, uh, that argument very well. You mentioned Orban, of course, in, in Hungary, who assumed the dictatorial powers at this point. Uh, uh, Kaczynski in Poland uh, is trying to steal the Polish presidential elections. Um, now, at the question I, I really have, um, uh, can uh, emergency harm autocrats? Uh, can emergency uh, help uh, uh, avoid autocrats uh, who are non-competent, for example, right? Is it, uh, so which way this, this tends to go? Is it always helpful for autocrats or can we imagine an alternative set of scenarios? So I think is, is having elections helpful to autocrats? Um, I, you broke up for a moment. Sorry. I, Oh, so you broke up for a moment, so I didn't catch the beginning of a question. Uh, are elections yeah, help? The question is, what? do emergencies, like, you know, the one we are going through now, help autocrats oh. to accumulate power and, um, and undermine democratic rule? Or we can imagine that uh, emergency of that kind can also uh, produce sets of developments will, which will be uh, sort of harmful to uh, uh, democratic tendencies and autocratic tendencies. So I think that depends on the stage of autocratic consolidation that you're at. I, I think that when uh, populists have mostly already won the game, and somebody like Viktor Orban has won the game long ago, uh, Hungary was no longer a democracy a few months ago. Uh, uh, then I think it makes it very easy for them to take over completely, to formalize uh, the newfound powers with the excuse given by something like the coronavirus and uh, reduce any remaining obstacles to their rule. Um, so in places where democratic deconsolidation was very far advanced, I would expect this, uh, the impact of this to be systematically bad for populists. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a little bit different in places where populists are in power uh, that have not yet uh, won as much ability to ignore the opposition, where uh, the playing field is a little uneven between the government and the opposition, but there are still truly meaningful elections. Uh, because in those places, I think a lot of them will run the danger of uh, being swept aside in a real wave of uh, discontent. Uh, that's why I think it might actually undermine uh, some of the populist governments that are now in power. When you think of countries like Brazil or perhaps Mexico um, or perhaps indeed the United States. Um, uh, the only last thing that I would add um, is that there's a set of questions about established dictatorships. Uh, now, established dictatorships, of course, have a sort of weird paradox that they appear extremely stable on one side because, you know, there's somebody who's in power who has complete control over levers of the state and there's no uh, uncertainty as to which way the next election is going to go if there is uh, uh, fake elections, as most dictatorships now do have. Um, uh, so they seem very stable. But on the other hand, we, of course, know that uh, actually, historically, a lot of dictatorships have proven quite unstable. After all, most democracies in the world used at some point in the history to be dictatorships uh, of one form or another. Uh, and I wonder whether some dictatorships may be swept aside by sheer incompetence uh, from the rulers. Uh, but it might not happen at all. Um, it may be overly optimistic, uh, but is it worth wondering whether in places like Iran or like Russia, this could create a real systemic crisis? Mm -hmm. I was struck by your argument that um, in the end of your remarks um, that um, the 
events on the ground in a way confirm on the one hand the populist uh, narrative and on the other hand they confirm anti-populist narrative uh, as well. Uh, uh, would that mean in the, in the end that we will have the polarization which uh, you know we experience in many places over the last uh, uh, so many years uh, that that po political polarization will be entrenched uh, uh, that will, you know, uh, those forces will sort of, you know, come into the position war, even using the uh, the arguments and evidence from uh, from the current crisis. Yeah. So look, I mean, I think perhaps there's uh, a few different outcomes depending on an interaction effect between what uh, forms of power and rhetoric are already present in the country and how well the government is performing. Um, I think the success of Viktor Orban in, in Hungary and of uh, the peace government in Poland in containing the virus has been slightly overstated in its early days, but they do appear to be uh, at least perceived as doing somewhat well. So you could imagine that in places where that's the case, it will really confirm the populist narrative and help them take power better, right? The, those populists who saw from a mile off that this is an opportunity to say, I told you so, this is proof of concept, and who then have the uh, governing ability to uh, at least somewhat competently actually take actions to combat uh, the coronavirus, they might come out on, on top. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, there's also lots of places like the United States in which the president is not consistently doing that. He has moments of doing that and when he stops doing that, and in which the government uh, reaction was very chaotic. And in those places, the anti-populist narrative may be, uh, uh, you know, which obviously I find more true to reality in any case, but may also then be the one that actually wins the public debate. I mean, look, again, I think the November election should be the last thing on our mind, but obviously it's hard not to think about it at all. Um, there is a chance that somehow the United States deals with this better than we thought, um, and, and we, we, we stumble into a situation where Trump wins re-election in a big way. Uh, I'm somewhat doubtful of that. I mean, I think the chances of a Biden victory has gone up, and the chances of a Biden landslide have gone up significantly in the last few months. I think it's time to uh, open the floor to questions from from other participants. So Elaine will be uh, in charge of uh, uh, controlling the uh, those questions. So Elaine, please, uh, if you see any hands up or... Uh... So um, I will um, invite people to ask their question. I see Aisha Kadioglu's hand is raised and I ask you all to just bear with us as we um, pull Aisha into um, speaking mode and um, into the video. So Aisha, in just a second, you will be brought into the video. And if you enable your video, everyone will be able to see and hear you. And I'm gonna pull in Tony Jones as well. And Tony, you'll be right after Aisha. It okay. takes takes a minute, and if you if you can hear Aisha, can you hear me? We can hear you. If you start your video, you will be visible. You're somewhere in the virtual world now. Between well, that's the clear sh shortcoming of uh, <laughs> yeah. Zoom technology. Oh, here she is. There she is. Yeah. Okay. For a moment we had, yeah, there you are. Let me see. Okay, great. Start my video, I see here. Uh, and let me click on that. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, sure. Yes. Go ahead, please. Okay, uh, great. Uh, it's great to see you all. Um, uh, I'm in my apartment in New York City. Um, I, um, uh, um, uh, Yasha, I mean, if I may say Yasha. Um, I, um, you were actually one of the first uh, who wrote uh, the piece I remember very well. It was titled Cancel Everything. And I must admit at that moment when I was reading it, you know, I thought maybe you were exaggerating, but here we are. Uh, everything is canceled and, you know, we are in social isolation. And throughout this process, uh, I have read a lot, you know, that you've been writing in The Atlantic. And I really like the fact that, I mean, I just want to say this, that you uh, 
um, uh, I mean, you didn't just go into this whether globalization will come to an end or whether European Union, because all of that, or whether European Union is going to collapse, all of that seems like too much of a far outcry to me. Uh, whereas, you know, uh, we want to know a bit of the near future, you know, uh, when will we be able to get out of our uh, homes? Uh, and in order for that to happen, I think, as you've indicated, there has to be an improvement in the uh, health system. Uh, one of the reasons we are home right now is because we don't want the health system to collapse, uh, you know, uh, and it, because if everyone was out there, the system would collapse. Uh, so we're actually protecting that. Um, so uh, how do you think that's going to come about? Is there a possibility for that to come about? And secondly, uh, as you indicated, you know, the enabling acts are coming out everywhere, you know, uh, Hungary being a major case in point. Uh, and when you say we should not let that happen, um, how can we do that now in, and in these, under these circumstances? I know that social media is an important, you know, um, I mean, medium for protest. Uh, but as Erika Chenoweth uh, of Harvard, you know, I mean, long ago has indicated, uh, you know, uh, social media can actually make it easier to lead to mass protests, uh, but then you know, uh, they don't really have a course of action. Uh, it doesn't lead to a course of action. So how can we make our voices heard really uh, when we're in isolation? Uh, I mean, do you see new forms of resistance? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, those are, those are great questions. Um, so there's a couple of things. I mean, the first is I like that, that it takes a moment to pull people into the conversation because it's a little bit like the digital equivalent of, you know, of a poor undergrad having to run around with a microphone trying to find the audience member who raised his or her hand. So as a sort of, um, it's a sort of analog to what we had in, in, in the real world. Um, just one other thought uh, sort of uh, triggered by, by, by your point about not going immediately to this means globalization has to end or whatever. You know, this is an extraordinary crisis and it's not one that people predicted. I mean, people predicted in the abstract that that there could be another pandemic. I mean, there's nothing particularly surprising about, uh, about this. We knew it was a possibility, but nobody had it on the scorecard of it happening tomorrow and nobody quite imagined it would be as impactful as it has been. And so I'm a little bit instinctively skeptical of the people who are immediately rushing to say, you see, I've had this solution to our political problems for the last 30 years, and now this proves that those solutions were right all along. But it doesn't mean everybody has to completely change their mind about everything. But if you think that, you know, this would never have happened if only we'd listened to, you know, the thing you were going on about for the last 30 years, and what we now have to do is the thing you've been talking about for, for the last 30 years, um, I, I think that's uh, a slightly sad indication of intellectual rigidity. So I'm trying to avoid that, but I see a lot of that out there. Um, now, uh, uh, two or two questions. Uh, what can we do? Um, look, I'm frankly, in countries like Hungary, what we can do is very, very limited. I mean, you know, for now, Orban is a dictator. That's it. Um, now, there will be the next round of elections, and uh, those are a good coordinating moment for people to come out in the streets and protest the fact that they were clearly stolen, as they will be. Um, you know, there might be a deep economic crisis which can mobilize people against his rule. There might be all kinds of opportunity to take on his power in the very hard way the democratic oppositions have done uh, in dictatorships for the last uh, 100 or so years. Um, at that point. Right now, he's in charge and he's taken power and that's it. Now, other political actors could do much more. I mean, the fact that Fidesz is still a member of the European People's Party in the European Parliament is absolutely shameful. And as we've been pointing out for a few years at this point, uh, uh, Orban is an existential threat to the European Union, probably more so in a way than Corona. I mean, the anger at the inability of the EU to help member states is going to be deep. And so Corona too is a crisis uh, from the point of the Europe, of European Union. But, you know, I, I'm now happily an American citizen. I'm still also a German citizen. I get why I should share my sovereignty with citizens in France or Italy or wherever, with citizens of other democracies. I don't get why I should share my sovereignty with a dictator in Hungary. And that's going to become a problem. So other political actors can do a lot more than they have. And I have to, rem oh, and the first question I suppose is, uh, uh, when we're going to come out of this and what we can do. Well, again, I think it goes back to, you know, we need to be taking the measures that allow us some modicum of return to normality, and that's the ability 
uh, to test at scale. It's ability to test for antibodies so that we can give certain people clearance to go back out into the world. It's to fast track uh, treatment options that turn out to have some uh, effic efficacy and to radically increase our health capacity. Um, I find it a little bit difficult to see how well we're doing on those things. I think we seem to be doing least well in the testing bit, least well on figuring out how we're gonna actually quarantine people. Seem to be doing somewhat better at expanding hospital capacity and producing ventilators, but they'll probably come too late for people, they will come. Um, but I worry about, you know, if we don't, if we're still gonna be flying blind and if we're still not gonna have worked out how to quarantine people, then we might come out for a few weeks and we have to go right back to, to social distancing. Thank you, Aisha. Um, Tony Jones, if you would like to enable your camera, we can see you. Um, or you'd like, if you'd like to just ask your question um, by audio, that is also up to you. Okay. Yeah. Hi, uh, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for organizing this. It's wonderful. So far, great success. Um, a couple of quick things. Um, firstly, um, the issue of whether or not the consequences of the virus will help or deter authoritarianism, I think it depends very much on who captures the narrative and how that narrative is, is, is handled. Um, so far, I, the, the signs in the US, I, I think clearly are that the narrative that's gonna be developed is to compare what happens with what might have happened if absolutely nothing had been done. And Trump has already said, you know, if, it, if I'd done nothing, we'd have two, two or three million deaths. Because of me, it's only going to be 100,000. Now, that's not a hard argument to make to people who are already very much in your favor and willing to, to, uh, to, get, to uh, let you off the hook. And I think the same kind of thing will be done in Hungary and other parts of the world. So it really depends on who captures the narrative. And the answer to that question really is, is the extent to which civil society and organized groups can capture that narrative and make it stick. I mean, that, that I think is, is the dynamic. But secondly, I'd like to move this, if, if we can, to, to, uh, to the European issue. Um, it seems to me that it's not too early to think about how we handle uh, the analysis of, of, in this case, Europe, when things begin to quieten down. I think trying to, to guess what's going to happen and predict all kinds of things is, is, is not very productive. Uh, Jagas and I and others remember, we, we tried this in, in the uh, 80s and 90s as the Soviet Union was collapsing and, and we were wrong. I mean, day by day we said things which the following day turned out to be wrong. So I think we should not do that in the, in the case of, of looking at consequences for Europe. But I think it's not too early to begin asking what kind of a roadmap for decision-making regarding uh, possible futures. It's not too early to begin, I think, to put that together. And let me suggest that there are sort of four things we might look at um, uh, and begin asking ourselves what we need to know so that we're ready to, to fill in the gaps as, as information becomes available. Firstly, is, is what are the consequences of this going to be internally for European countries? And clearly it's going to be very different in, in different countries. But I think asking that question is, 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 uh, is, in, is an important first step. The second step, I think, is to ask what the consequences are going to be for relationships between the European countries. Uh, we're already beginning to see some problems as the Italians want a, a Euro bond and the Germans have said no, no, no. So beginning to see some new fault lines developing along those lines and we may be in for a replay of, of the, of the Greek-German uh, issue of a few years ago. Thirdly, I think we, sh we should ask ourselves, what are the consequences of this gonna be for the European as an organization? To what extent is it gonna be able to handle these, these changes? What changes in its rules and its organization and, and structure and so forth are going to happen? So I think that, that is, is uh, sort of an important set of questions. And then lastly, um, and much more difficult. What is all of this going to mean for Europe's place in the world, economically, politically, in terms of influence and so forth? Um, if we could sort of already begin to sort of map out the kinds of questions we'd like answers to, then we can begin to discuss these as, as it becomes clear what's actually going to happen. 
Let me suggest that this is um, important, not just for European studies, but uh, for the social sciences more generally. What makes Europe interesting <coughs> it is precisely the fact that these countries are not standalone countries. The US is a standalone, most of the world's countries are standalone. But the European countries are so tightly integrated that their fate of one in essentially affects the fate of all. And Europe's ability to face the world and, and to thrive in, in difficult times depends very much on its ability to hold together and to function efficiently. Um, so I think that these four questions, internal, uh, international, between the European countries, uh, the European Union itself, and then the place of the EU in, in the rest of the world, these are the kinds of things maybe we can start thinking about asking questions on and develop a kind of a, a questionnaire for ourselves or a roadmap, if you like, to, to look at how this is going. What would you think of doing that? Yeah, look, I think the taxonomy seems seems very promising and there's a certain the four kinds of questions we should ask. I mean, there's different ways of cutting that conceptual space, uh, but I agree both, both with that taxonomy broadly and, 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 and with uh, the temptation a lot of people have to predict things that will likely turn out to be wrong. And I actually, I mean, my hunch at the moment, and that's a kind of prediction as well, uh, is that people are in a too facile way saying that this is going to change everything. Um, when you think back to 9-11, which is not, an, not a great precedent because nothing is a great precedent, but it's one of the better precedents we have. 9-11 changed a lot in a few small areas and it changed a lot of areas a little bit. Um, and I think that's most likely to happen with uh, uh, the coronavirus as well. Hopefully it'll change our public health systems very significantly. It might change some social habits, perhaps in the United States, it will become normal for people to wear masks when they feel a little bit sick. There will be a big change in our mm -hmm. public spaces. I cannot imagine that it'll stop people from traveling. I don't think five years from now, people are gonna be using planes less. I don't yeah. think they're gonna be going out to restaurants less. And I don't really think there's gonna be less cross-border trade. Um, again, those are predictions in the fog of pandemic and they may turn out to be very wrong, um, uh, but that would be my hunch. Just briefly to your first point about uh, how Trump will play this. Look, I agree that Trump will likely try and play that way. I think I'm a little bit less pessimistic about uh, how much success he'll find with that. There's you know, a part of a population that's deeply in his tank and that only listens to media sources that adore him and uh, you know, they're not gonna turn against him and they'll say, oh, isn't Trump amazing because he's made sure that only 100,000 American dies. I think that's a tough sell for the rest of the country. I mean, for somebody who said for four years that he is God's gift to humanity, that he has a unique ability to solve problems, that he alone can protect American people, to have to pitch his reelection effort on only 100,000 people died, especially when it might be the case that in other countries, uh, the, the pro capita fatality rate is significantly lower. That's not an easy electoral pitch. Thank you. Very cool for me. Thank you so much, Professor, and thank you to Team CES for organizing this great event. Uh, greetings from the southeast of Ireland. The question I had is brief, and Anthony Jones actually referred to it. I just wanted to ask if you wouldn't mind reading the tea leaves and saying what impact you think this could have on Eurozone governance in the short and medium term. Thanks. Yeah, I have to say that's probably the question that's important right now that I have least of a developed view on. Um, uh, you know, I, look, Eurobonds is an important question, right? Uh, Eurobonds doesn't first solve the underlying issue, which is that you have an economic union without a political union. Um, you know, I think skeptics of what was happening in the Eurozone were saying a year ago, two years ago, that that problem still hasn't been resolved and that the next economic crisis is gonna bring it right back to the fore. Um, uh, you know, that was an easy call. I got that one right, but lots of people got that one right. It wasn't that hard to get right. Um, I think that's what describes the situation now. Will we have Eurobonds or not? I mean, you know, probably we'll have some kind of fudge, which is, you know, a Eurobond by a different name, but not very ambitious or whatever, perhaps, I don't know. Um, but will we solve that fundamental structural mismatch? Probably not, and if we don't, what will be economic consequences? Who knows? I mean, that's very worrying to me. Thank you, Barry. Um, Carl, if you'd like to 
turn on your video, we'll be able to see you, or you can just ask your question. You are muted, Carl. Okay. Yeah, please. Okay, good. Now we can hear you. We can okay, hear you. Very good. Uh, but you can't see me. Well, that may be an advantage. Who knows? Oh, stop my video. Okay, very good. Here we go. Yeah. Ah. Good. Yeah, here we go. Well, greetings to all of you. I'm well in Scronston, New Hampshire, far away from beaver, far away from people and nearer to beavers. Yasha, I have a question to you. What do you do when an autocrat in a democracy turns the system? Let's say Trump, uh, he declares, arguing, I want to save lives, uh, that elections can't take place. Ele elections by vote are corrupt. We've heard that argument. The Republican Party, he has that in his hands, will not do anything. The classical instrument of protest in democracies, namely the right to assembly, is not available. The public protest cannot take place because of the virus. The media are divided, so the battle will take place in the media. So what could we do in a democracy like ours in such yeah. a situation? I mean, that's a very large worry. Uh, look, the problem in the United States is even if you could have protest, um, that's not that likely to be effective uh, against the Supreme Court. And what we saw in the uh, sort of sad little drama over the Wisconsin election a couple of days ago is that we might end up with uh, another Supreme Court uh, decision, which uh, potentially influences uh, who the next yeah. president is, um, along a five to four partisan vote, depending exactly on who was appointed by uh, Republicans and who was appointed by Democrats. I mean, that's what the postal vote uh, decision by the Supreme Court on Monday night, I believe it was, came down to. Um, and that's a very worrying preview of what we may have coming up to November. Um, now, I think uh, one thing we can do is to try and mobilize as much as possible, including with some of the elements of the Republican Party that aren't entirely Trumpified, to solve this problem in a nonpartisan way well before November. I know a lot of organizations that are trying to do that. Um, that's certainly the right approach, but I don't know how promising it is, um, because now it already is uh, polarized. Donald Trump has already proven willing uh, to subvert it. Now, the other thing we can do is um, to uh, make clear so far as we can to people how scandalous this is uh, so that people turn against the government. And there might be some real prospect of that. I think especially coming on top of general mismanagement and lots of deaths and economic crisis, uh, you know, the argument that, uh, you know, Donald Trump and big parts of the conservative establishment are trying to steal this election, um, if they in fact try to do that, um, could sway some people who otherwise, you know, don't like Democrats particularly, uh, who are actually quite torn about who to vote for, uh, that might in fact be an effective argument to, to moving them into the democratic column. Um, I'm not particularly sanguine about either of those answers, but th those seem like the best remedies we have available. And if, we, if you can think of a better one, uh, please, please let me know what it is. Thank you, Carl. Uh, Caladora? Yeah, um, can you see me? Yeah. Um, so thank you. Um, I see that there are two main arguments that are being pitted against the whole social distancing measure. So one of them seems like a pitting an economy and like job loss against health, which seems like a false dichotomy to me. But the other one I think is more convincing, which is like a civil liberties versus health debate. Um, and how far would you be willing to go in terms of, uh, I guess, I mean, there is, it is an erosion of civil liberty to say that you can't go outside or to say that, you know, you're banning restaurants or forcing people to not work. But in most people seem to think that it's, justified as I would in this instance. Where do you draw the line? I mean, if you limited everyone to driving their cars five miles an hour, you certain, most certainly would save thousands of lives every year, but it's not something we're willing to do because we think of it as you know, infringing on our ability to choose what we want to do for ourselves. Um, are those, are any, is any disruption of civil liberties warranted in a time of crisis as long as you get rid of them afterwards? Or is there, are there some civil liberties you just can't take away, no matter how bad the crisis is? Yeah. 
No, I don't think there's easy answers, right? I mean, so far as there's an easy answer, it's to fulfill the three conditions I talked about. And I think we can take very extreme measures to fight this virus while fulfilling those three conditions. So that to me is red lines. Um, but then the other things, so when you're in the realm of things that are under democratic control, that are temporary and that are clearly necessary to save lives, uh, there's still a big normative question, right? I mean, as you're saying, we don't take every step we could to save lives um, because we recognize that those liberties weigh very, very heavily. Um, and so the problem there is both, but I don't think there's a sort of a priori way uh, of answering that question and people will reasonably fall on different sides of, of a question. And then B, it does depend on the nature of a trade-off. So now in the early stages where we would be completely overwhelming the health system if we didn't uh, have extreme social uh, distancing, where we don't have any treatments yet, where we haven't expanded health cap capacity and so on, um, I think it's very clear on which side of a trade-off we fall. Um, but the situation will keep evolving and the situation keeps evolving. So you have to keep reassessing uh, the trade-off and, 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 and that's a really, really hard thing to do. Um, the only thing that I feel, uh, you know, goes beyond, I mean, we can have a debate about particular things um, and I'll have strong opinions about which side to fall on, but the only other metaphor that I think is helpful as guidance to this is that for defenders of democracy, there are dangers on both sides. There's a danger in too easily trading in civil liberties in a way we don't have to, which is both too big a sacrifice in itself um, and then might empower autocrats who use that to entrench their power. Uh, but there is also a danger on the side of not being willing to take the measures that will save lots of lives. And that's significantly damaging people's trust in democracy. Because if we tell people the only way to have civil liberties is to let a million people die, then a lot of people will choose to give up on their civil liberties. Um, yeah. Well, I, I think we've run out of time. Um, I'd like to thank all of the attendees for joining us this afternoon. Um, but I would especially like to thank Yasha and Jay Gorsh for, for facilitating what has been a very stimulating discussion. Can, can I say, I, I normally hate it when people say, you know, I thank everybody, but in, in these, you know, quite unpleasant times as I'm stuck uh, in front of my blue wall or the messy apartment in Blue Wall Heights, um, it really has been a, a soothing to my soul to see so many uh, old friends and some new acquaintances. Um, so, so genuinely from the bottom of my heart, thank you to everybody for organizing this and for showing up. Thank you. And thank you for being our guinea pig, Yasha. Right. Seems to have done well. Yes. Right. Right. We can use you more often for risky ventures. All right. <laughs> we, we will have another session next week and um, be on the lookout, everyone, for the details which will come soon. <laughs>